All right, there we go. All right, so today we're going to continue our discussion of chapter 11, okay, which is talking about innate immunity. And today we're going to talk about the second line of defense, specifically cellular and molecular defenses. Okay? And then next week we'll talk about the adaptive immune system, which is the third line of defense. All right, so today we're going to go over the learning objectives. I'm going to open it up for questions. Then we'll talk about cellular defenses, molecular defenses, including inflammation. Actually, inflammation is a combination of these two. And then we'll talk about what to do for next time. All right, so this chapter helps us move toward being able to do the following. Define the key role of evolution as it applies to microbiology. Identify microbial structures and connect the structures to their functions. Identify, identify pivotal components of microbial systems important to human health and analyze and describe the impact of microorganisms. Okay. All right, any questions? All right, if I'm moving on too quick and you just didn't get a chance to get to your mute button, feel free to ask. I'm happy to back up and answer any questions. In the meantime, let's talk about cellular defenses. So let's go to the whiteboard. That's cute. I have no idea where that came from. All right, so one thing first off, I need to uh, post a correction. Uh, last time when we were talking about the first line of defense and we were talking about barriers and we were talking about mucus. I said that that was a uh, physical barrier, okay, because it was sticky. And then I said the action of the cilia in moving the mucus was a mechanical or moving barrier, okay. Well, the book was more simple than that. So we're going to go with the book. So mucus is a mechanical. Okay. Because it is being moved by the ciliated mucosal cells. Okay. So, yeah. So mechanical is more accurate. I was trying to make things more complicated. My apologies on that. Okay, any questions on why mucus is considered a mechanical barrier versus a physical barrier, which is what I thought incorrectly. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about cellular defenses. So uh, today, to kind of give you a handle on how to group the cells that we're going to talk about, I'm going to be grouping them according to job, okay? Because that's how it works for me. If I can put things together into groups where they're mostly the same, then after that, all I have to do is remember what makes them different, if that makes sense, okay? So I'm going to group them according to jobs. So these cells all do this, okay? With the one exception that this particular one of the three does this special thing in addition to what everybody else does, okay? So, oh, let me just show you what I'm talking about, okay? All right, so we have two different types of white blood cells, okay? So what we're talking about today are white blood cells. Sometimes we abbreviate that as WBC, okay? As opposed to red blood cells, which are RBCs, okay? We also call them um, leukocytes. So three different ways of referring to these guys. Okay. Now, under the microscope, 
uh, we can group them into two different groups based on their appearance. And that kind of goes with their jobs. So let's go ahead and get the, the two different groups, okay? We have granulocytes. Okay. So when I look at them under the microscope, they look grainy. Okay, they look like they're full of sand or little little pebbles. Okay. So granulocytes, when we stain them and look at them under the microscope, they are grainy. Okay. And then we have very cleverly named agranulocytes. Okay. So A, remember, means no. So not grainy. Okay, now that's under the light microscope. We're not going to worry about what they look like underneath the electron microscope. Okay, that's beyond what I want to cover in this class. Okay, so under the category of granulocytes, okay, we have two rather broad groups. Okay, well, one specific and then one broad. So we have neutrophils. So when we stain uh, blood smears, okay, generally what we do is we put on an acidic stain, eosin, and then we put on a um, basic stain, um, which is methylene blue. Sometimes they use other basic stains, but that's a common one. Neutrophils will stain with both, and they uh, have kind of a purple color. Because, you know, you take red and blue and you mix it together. Eosin, by the way, is a red stain. You take red and blue, mix it together, you get purple. Okay. So neutrophils, okay, are um, purple when you stain them. Okay. I did them in red. For some unknown reason, let's go ahead and do them in purple. Um, and their job is to be the first responders. Okay, whenever there's an injury or an infection, they generally get there first, okay? Just because there's so many of them, okay? So we also tend to see them, you know, when you have an acute infection, their numbers go up really quick to help fight the infection, okay? So they are the first responders. They are also phagocytic. That means they can take their membranes and wrap around solid particles or bacteria and swallow them on down, okay? So they are phagocytic. Okay. And then they also do another clever thing, okay? That I just think is incredibly cool. Um, they will release Toxins into the environment as, is a part of um, trying to fight. Okay. Um, so, you know, they do release their granules into the environment. If they were not a granulocyte, they would not have these inclusions that are full of all sorts of nasty stuff that they dump into the environment to help protect. Okay. So actually up here under granulocytes, all of them release some sort of chemical. Because, you know, that's why they have those granules. Okay? So I'm not gonna put that down here because it's true of all of them. Okay, so they, these are the first responders, they're phagocytic, okay? Now, if releasing their toxins into the environment don't keep things under control, okay? These guys will explode. And the contents of their granules will mix with their DNA, the chromosomes that becomes unraveled. And it's like throwing a toxic net over the, um, over the bacteria, 
okay? And also innocent bystander cells, okay? So we call these neutrophil extracellular traps or nets. I don't know why, but that just sounds incredibly cool. Now, when we get to inflammation, I will be bringing up nets and the release of toxic chemicals again, uh, because this is why chronic, in, uh, um, chronic uh, inflammation can cause disease, okay? It's good in the short term, but you don't want it going on for a long time, okay? Because innocent bystander cells are being harmed by some of these cells trying to, to clear out an infection. All right, now these next three, I'm going to group together, okay? Because they all do a similar job, okay? They all fight allergies, okay? They, and they all fight parasites. Now, generally when we talk about parasites, okay? we're talking about one of two things, eukaryotic cells, okay? So things like amoebas, giardia, malaria, okay? So in comparison to our cells, they're pretty big, okay? So it's kind of hard for your phagocytic cells to wrap themselves around these other eukaryotic cells. They can do it if it's a protozoa, okay? We're also talking about things like worms, Worms and flutes, yeah, which are a type of worm. They're a flatworm. Um, and they are way too big for a single white blood cell to phagocytize, okay? So what they do instead is they land on them, they get a whole bunch of these cells that I'm gonna tell you about, and they drop their chemical loads on the surface of the worm and kind of eat holes in its skin and kill the worm that way, okay? So we have, three different kinds of cells that do this, okay? We have eosinophils. Actually, I'm not sure if there's an E in there or not, okay? Eosinophils stain with the acidic dye eosin, and eosin is a red dye, so that's why I put it in red, okay? Then we have mast cells, Oh, let's not do bath cells. Let's do basal cells next. Okay. So basophils stain with the basic stain, um, uh, methylene blue or, or whatever we happen to be using. So they are attracted to a basic stain. That's why they're a basophil. Okay. And then... It also stains with a blue stain. We'll do a little lighter blue stain. We have mast cells. Okay. So all three of these cells do this particular thing. Okay. They fight allergies and they fight parasites. Okay. Now let's talk about what makes them different. Okay. Eosinophils will increase in numbers. in response to allergies, okay? So, you know, they, uh, they fight pollen, they phagocytize, you know, the pollen grains and that kind of thing. Um, but when somebody has chronic allergies that are caused by allergens, okay? Those are antigens that are not associated with a, a pathogen but your immune system still responds to it, okay? So if I have seasonal allergies, hay fever, okay? This time of year, it's beautiful, spring is coming, the plants are blooming, and I'm sneezing my brains out, okay? If you were to take a blood sample, you would see increased numbers of eosins, eosinophils, okay? Uh, basophils, despite the fact that they are also involved in fighting allergies, do not increase in numbers, okay, unless you have cancer that is associated with basophils, okay? So their numbers in health stay the same.
So if we ever see an increase in the number of basophils, uh, we become concerned. Okay. Now mast cells, we used to think that they were a subset of basophils. Okay. Turns out they come from a different blood cell lineage. Okay. So it's kind of like these two guys went to the same school, learned the same job, but they're not actually from the same family. Okay. But they do the same job. Okay. Mast cells hang out in tissues. Okay. So we tend to find them on our mucosal surfaces okay, and underneath the skin. So they hang out in tissues where they're likely to respond to allergies, allergens, and parasites and bacteria. Okay, first. So they're kind of like the neutrophils. There's just not so many of them and they don't circulate around. Okay, they're like the guards on the wall. Okay, now these guys also do some phagocytosis, but it's not a major part of what they do. So I'm not going to test you on that part. Neutrophils on the, on the other hand, they are majorly phagocytic. They do a lot of phagocytosis, eating down the bacteria and stuff. Okay. All right, questions so far? Yes, Michelle. Um, when you're talking about these three different tissues that do allergies and parasites, so they increase their number, the eosinophils increase their number um, when there's allergies, what are they doing to fight the allergy by increasing their numbers? How is that helping allergies? Um, so what they do is they do phagocytize things like pollen. Okay. Right? Or if you're like me and you're allergic to the fragrance of laundry detergent, they're phagocytizing those big, scary organic molecules. Um, they also release chemicals, okay, that bring in other cells that help them fight. Yeah. Okay. And so because of their um, activity with worms, okay, parasites, um, we tend to see with folks who um, have worm infestations, we tend to see an increase of, of eosinophils. I probably should put that down. Okay. But mm -hmm. what we've found, and this is a hypothesis that we've had a hard time naming down, um, but we seem to see a correlation with uh, if you have no worms, you tend to have more allergies. Oh. So it's almost like these guys are wandering around uh -oh. looking for trouble because, you know, they're bored and they got nothing to do. So, so by the way, having a few worms, it's good for you. You just don't want to have a whole lot. Do the, um, do the other two then act the same way? For whatever, yeah, basophils um, do kind of the same thing. They release chemicals, okay? that bring other um, cells in. They're kind of like, hey, and in the meantime, I might eat a few of them, okay? They also help by dropping bombs on worms. Okay. Uh, but they just, for whatever reason, um, they, they don't increase in numbers. Okay. Yeah. Uh, mass cells, uh, we generally have them evenly distributed, okay? Well, okay, that's a, a, an overgeneralization, but you can think of it that way. They're through evenly throughout the tissues that have contact with the outside environment. Okay. We uh -huh. do see an awful lot of them around virus patches, but they do the same thing. They, they uh, release chemical signals that say, hey, come help. And while okay. help is coming, I'm going to eat a few guys. Got it. But they're okay. really waiting for these to come and really start hitting the buffet. Waiting for what to come? Oh, like neutrophils. Okay. And then some agranulocytes that also are highly phagocytic. Okay. Yeah. So mainly they're hanging around waiting to say, hey, we got a problem here. Okay. Uh, with the exception of the eosinophils, they increase in numbers. So, um, you know, like I said, with worms, we do have 
microscopic. We, we watched them cluster around worms and drop their bombs and then the poor little worm spasms and dies. Okay. Okay, yeah. good. Thank you. Yeah. So one thing I did not mention is these two are associated with a cell signal, a chemical that you're all familiar with. Histamine. <laughs> During allergy season, what do you take? An antihistamine. Okay, we're trying to stop the action of these guys so that we can relieve the, the allergy symptoms that make you feel like you've got a cold coming up. But it just never progresses and it doesn't get better until the plants stop putting their pollen into the air. Yeah, so, and we'll, when we get to, to chemical defenses, uh, we'll bring up histamine again, okay? Okay, how are we doing? I'm trying not to overly complicate things. I'm trying to give you a kind of a general foundation so that when you read through the book and you get more details, it's like, okay, I've got a, I've got a shelf to put that, the, the further information in. Okay, are we ready to move on to a granulocyte? The not grainy cells. Okay, we have, now here's another group of cells that are highly phagocytidic. That is one of their main jobs is to wrap around solid stuff and swallow it down, okay? So we have monocytes, and we call them monocytes because when you look at these guys under the microscope, they tend to have funky looking nuclei, okay? They have lobes, they're horseshoe shaped, they're, you know, so if you look at them from a certain angle, it looks like they have more than one nucleus. These guys obviously have one nucleus. And so that's why we call them monocytes, okay? Now these guys are circulating around in your blood and your limb, okay? When they get a call from these guys or these guys, they leave the circulatory systems, okay? Or the lymphatic system, and they go into the tissues following the scent, okay, the chemical signal. They're going up the concentration gradient to the source of where the chemical re was released, looking for where the problem is, okay? And as they do so, they mature into macrophages. Macrophages, okay? or big eaters, okay? By the time they get there, the neutrophils are already there and they're eating away. But these guys are bigger cells and they can eat more faster, okay? Uh, so next week, we're gonna talk about what these guys do as far as talking to the, um, to the other guys I'm gonna mention next, okay? But to introduce you to the idea they are antigen presenting cells, okay, or APCs. So once they eat something down, they will display bits and pieces of what they've eaten on their surfaces and they go around to these other cells saying, hey, are you looking for this guy? Okay, so it's kind of like, you know, the arresting officer, they take a mug shot and then they go around to all of the Detectives saying, hey, you looking for this guy for a crime? <laughs> we have him in custody. <laughs> okay, so that's what macrophages do. Um, and sometimes they will stay in a specific area and they become, at least I'm pretty sure this is how it works, um, they become dendritic cells. Okay, dendritic cells are dendrites. Okay, so they are phagocytic cells that um, have a lot of extensions, kind of a frilly edge that makes them look like the dendrites on a neuron. Okay, so they are frilly. Okay, 
Now they can uh, move around, but they generally don't circulate, okay, like the monocytes do. Um, so they tend to hang out in tissues also, although they can go from where they're stationed to the lymph nodes and back. So they do move around, but we, when we take a blood sample, we tend not to see dendritic cells, okay? We tend to see them in biopsies. So we find dendritic cells an awful lot in the skin, uh, we also tend to find them just underneath the uh, mucosa. And we tend to find them in lymph nodes. Now that doesn't mean that um, uh, we don't see them other places. That's just where we find them more often, okay? So those are the three areas I want you to remember, okay? They're, they're just under the epidermis, we find them uh, under the mucosa, associated with tire patches, but you know, it's part of the mucosa. And we tend to find them in lymph nodes. Okay. And they are also antigen presenting cells. Okay. Oh, and I did not put it up here, but both of these, their main job is phagocytosis. And in association with phagocytosis, antigen presenting. Okay. So the main difference came monocytes we find circulating, looking for trouble. When they migrate into tissues, they become these big phagocytes and they don't have these frilly edges. Okay. Um, and they can move around. Some of them stay put wherever they go to. Like if they go to the liver and they stay put, we have a specific name for them. If they get into the brain and stay put, we have a specific name for them. I'm not going to make you learn that. Um, but just so you know, when you get to AMP and you do learn it, yeah, you know, these are specialized macrophages. Dendritic cells, dendrites, okay, um, are highly phagocytic cells that have frilly edges, and we mainly find them under the skin, under the mucosa, and in the lymph nodes. Okay. All right, questions. How are we doing? You ready for me to clear the board? I've run out of room. I have one more group of uh, cells I'm going to talk about very briefly because we're going to talk about them mostly next week. Okay, okay so also under the category of a granule low. Yeah, let's start over. Okay. We have a specific category of egg granulocytes called lymphocytes. Because mainly, and put that in quotes, mainly, we find them circulating in the lymph, okay? Or we find them in the lymph nodes, okay? You can find them in other areas, but that's mainly where we find them, okay? So in the lymph and in the lymph. Nodes. Okay. And they're kind of funky looking. They're smaller cells than the other ones we've talked about, but they've got huge nuclei. Okay. It's like, do you even have any cytoplasm there? And we have, for the purposes of this class, we have three different kinds of lymphocytes. Okay. Um, the lymphocytes that function in innate immunity, okay, are called natural killer cells or NK cells. Okay. Uh, these guys go through tissues, okay, following the path of the lymph, okay, looking for cells that don't look right, okay. Okay, 
So those would be cells that um, are not uh, communicating what they're making, okay? So cells that have low to no MHC, major histocompatibility complex, okay? And what that is, and we're gonna talk about this next week as well, but you know, uh, repetition is the key to learning. And we'll put our natural killer cell with its great big nucleus, okay? Um, all cells in the body display this kind of uh, V-shaped protein, okay? And they show bits and pieces of what they're making. And okay? so they can say, oh, I'm making small ribosomal subunits, okay? And the natural killer cell, we'll go ahead and label this one, okay, it has MHC2, which they shake hands with them and they say, oh yeah, you know, ribosomes are fine. Okay. Or this one will say, oh, yeah, I'm making um, microtubuli, and I can't say it. Okay. And so it says, oh, yeah, yeah, that's supposed to be here. That's fine. Maybe, you know, but if they're busy making viruses, say this is a virally infected cell, and instead of making, uh, you know, parts of what it should be making, you know, it's making spikes, but this is a smart virus. It's not displaying them on the surface yet. Uh, this poor cell just does not have the time or the energy to make MHC. So if the natural killer cell comes along and doesn't find anything to shake hands with, it will release toxic chemicals okay, that bore a hole and allow another toxic chemical to go in and tell the cell to commit suicide. Okay, so that's why we call them natural killer cells. Okay, um, by the way, the fancy dancy term, which I say wrong, okay, a, a, I want to say apoptosis. Okay, but it's apoptosis. Or anyway, I'm going to have to practice that one. Okay, but it's programmed cell death. Okay, so once the cell gets the signal, um, then it just goes ahead and dies, okay? And hopefully it will take the virus down with it, okay? Now, this is a virally infected cell. If it's a cancer cell and it's so busy dividing, okay, that it doesn't have time to display MHC on its surface, okay? The same thing happens. Natural killer cell comes along, bores a hole in the, the membrane, and releases chemicals that say die, die, die. Okay. So natural killer cells are mainly involved in getting rid of virally infected cells, okay, and cancer cells. Because they're screening for anything that doesn't look right. Okay. Now they are part of the innate immune system. They can't be part of learning to target a cell that is specifically making a virus, okay? So eventually this virus has to bud. So eventually it's got to put its, its spikes in the cell membrane. And we have another type of cell that comes in and recognizes specific spikes, specific antigens, okay? And then it does the same thing. It tells the cell to commit suicide. Okay, so these guys are cousins. But the cells that recognize, okay, these specific spikes, okay, are T cells. Okay, T because they grow up in the thymus. Okay, and as we learn next week, they've got a specific name when they come around looking, okay, for trouble. Okay. So we have T cells, okay? T cells go after specific antigens on other cells, okay? They also talk to other uh, white blood cells, 
Okay, they help coordinate activities and they also help uh, stop the immune response once we're done. Okay, so T cells, depending upon the type of T cells, they do a bunch of different stuff. Okay, now these are part of the adaptive immune system. So we're going to talk more about them next week. Okay, and then lastly, we have B cells. And B cells' entire job is to produce antibodies. It's a bit simplistic, but that's good enough for now. Okay. So they release antibodies, and they're these Y shaped molecules that they have these ends that fit onto specific antigens. Okay, so and we've talked about antibodies before. <laughs> so these cells would make antibodies that would specifically grab a hold of a spike, whether it's on the surface of a cell or whether it's on a virus that's floating around. Okay. All right. How are we doing on, on the types of uh, different types of cells? When they grab that spike, Teresa, is that some sort of protection from the spike or what does it do when it grabs it? Just sort of covers it and hangs on? Yeah, it covers it and hangs on exactly. And okay. when it covers it and hangs on, this spike can't grab a hold of a new host cell. Okay. Because right. it's busy being covered by this antibody and this antibody is not going to allow it to stick to another cell. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, you're quite welcome. And uh, when we talk about uh, complement, we'll talk about some of the things that uh, antibodies do. Okay. But let us go back to the PowerPoint. I'm going to ask you at least one question. Uh, we're getting pretty close on time, but that's all right. We are still going to do one question because I've been talking for too long. Okay, why is it? All right, we'll do that. All right, so let me get a poll up. Okay, which of the following cells of the innate immune system would you expect to see at the site of an injury first? Uh, we got some good early voting. We got 25% of you. Okay, we'll pass 50%. We're almost to 75%. There we go, 75%. See if we can get to 100%. Okay, we're at 83. Let's see if we can get a few more. 91. We just need one more person. Okay, just for the sake of time, I'm going to end the poll. Okay, most of you picked neutrophils. Very good. Okay, we've got more neutrophils circulating. And so when a signal goes out saying, help, 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 they get there first. Okay, now if you picked basophils, you were close. Okay, basophils are related to mast cells, and mast cells are already in the tissues. They're likely to already be there. Um, but, you know, we generally, uh, I, you know, I would allow mast cells, okay? Basophils do circulate because there's so few of them. Um, we tend, they tend to not get there until later, okay? Unless they happen to be there when the injury occurred. All right, I'm going to skip this next question just for the sake of time, uh, but I will have them in the practice quiz, okay, by the end of the week. Yeah.
Okay, let's talk about molecular defenses. Okay, cytokines. Cytokines first and then complement. All right. So cytokines are chemical signals that are released by cells. Okay. okay. So it's how they talk to each other. Okay. So one cell will release a, a molecule, another cell receives it, says, oh, really? And sends another one back or sends one to itself, okay? Kind of like sending, you know, making a post-it note, note to self, do this, okay? So there's a number of cytokines, okay? And, you know, uh, they're all very interesting, but they all do the same job, okay? Uh, they may do specific parts of the job, but they all do cell communication. Well, let's see that now. Okay. So that's mainly what I want you to get from cytokines. Okay. It's, it's how the cells talk to each other. So you've got a number of different cytokines, and you're going to learn more about those in AMP. One of them that you already know, histamine. Okay. Another one that I personally find interesting is interferon. Okay, because it's involved. Um, well, one of the first ways that we, one of the first things we found that it does is uh, virally infected cells will release interferon saying it's too late for me, save yourself. And it stimulates neighboring cells to do things to fight that virally, viral infection, okay? So interferon interferes with viral infection. As a virologist, I find that very interesting. Okay, and then you have interleukins and you've got uh, prostaglandins and all sorts of different classes of cytokines, okay? Uh, but pretty much just know that they are involved in cell communication with each other. You probably should know histamine just because it's one that you're familiar with and because, you know, I geek out about interferon. Yeah, you might want to read up on that one, okay? So we'll talk about cytokines again when we talk about um, inflammation, okay? Because inflammation starts with the release of cytokines, okay? The signal goes out saying, help, 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 okay? All right, let's get to compliments. Okay, complement are uh, serum proteins. It might be more accurate to say plasma proteins. Oh, well, sure, let's go with that because, you know, it's a literature. Let's say plasma protein. You also find them in the lymph, okay? And in the uh, exudate and interstitial fluid and all of the names that we have for pretty much what's the same stuff is just where it's at, okay? And why it got there. They are plasma proteins that complement, okay, or aid the immune response, okay? So for this class, you don't have to remember that C3 starts the cascade and it splits into C3A and C3B and what they do, okay? What I want you to know is a foundation about what complement does is I want you to know the three ways that it starts. And I want you to know the three ways or the three results. Okay. The middle stuff you can learn later. All right. So there are three ways 
that the complement system starts. Okay, so I'm going to draw just kind of little circles of different complement proteins, and they're floating around in the blood just looking for trouble. Okay, and when they bind to stuff, that's when the cascade starts. Okay, so I'm going to get three different pathogens set up here. And I'm going to get a couple of gram negative or gram positive cells. And I'm going to get a fungus here, filamentous cell. Actually, you know, in your blood, it's more likely going to be yeast. So let's go ahead and do a big old yeast cell. Okay. All right. So if you have been exposed to a pathogen before, okay you're going to have antibodies floating around in your blood, okay, looking for that antigen, okay? So let's say that uh, this pathogen has an antigen. They've got these little lumpy things, okay? Okay, or they might have flagella, or they might have fimbrae, okay? There's any a number of things that you can develop antibodies against, okay? I would say that I've got an antibody that grabs a hold, okay, here. And this one grabs a hold here. This part, this, the, the branched part of the Y is the part that grabs a hold of the antigen, okay? This part that sticks up here is called the FC or constant region. That's this part here, okay? Complement will bind to the FC portion and that will start the cascade, okay? And because we discovered this first, we call it the classical pathway. So the classical pathway involves antibodies with complement binding to the FC portion or the constant region, the stem of the Y, okay? and starting the cascade, okay? So let's get the same pathogen here. Let's say it's the first time I've ever been exposed, okay? But complement will bind to certain structures that are unique to bacteria, unique to other pathogens, okay? And remember, we call these microbial associated molecular patterns or MAPs, okay? They are molecules that we never make, okay? And so um, complement will bind to those, okay? So, whoops, wrong color. Complement will bind to MAPs, okay, and start the cascade, okay, if it is a molecular associated, uh, um, microbial associated molecular pattern that the complement recognizes, okay. So we call this the alternative. Okay, because it was discovered second, so it was the alternative to the classical pathway. Okay. How are we doing so far? Okay, certain pathogens, especially fungi, tend to make a fancy dancy sugar that we humans tend not to make, okay? And it's called mannose, okay? Mannose is a sugar, a carbohydrate, okay? And we have circulating in our bodies proteins that fit mannose, okay? And we call them uh, lectin binding mannose proteins or something along that line, okay? Uh, but lectin is in the name because they are uh, the chemical class of lectins. 
maybe they're mammals like some vitamin proteins. So anyway, I'm going to have to go look, look to find out exactly what it is. Okay. But the point is, is that they bind mannose and complement will bind them. Okay. So we call this one the lectin pathway or the lectin binding pathway. Okay. So those are three different ways that it starts. Okay. Classical involves antibodies. The alternative pathway involves molecular associate or microbial associated molecular patterns, MAMPs that uh, the complement will bind to, okay? And then you have the lectin binding pathway, okay? Where these lectin molecules that recognize mannose, okay, bind to the mannose and start the pathway, okay? So all of these will lead to a cascade, okay? That's where one complement protein binds, it splits, it goes off and tells other things to do their thing. And so it's kind of like when you send in a 911 call, you get the ambulance, you get the, the fire department and you get the police, okay? All from one call. Uh, yes, Michelle. Is the, why do they um, go after the, the mannose? Is there something bad about that? It's just because it's associated with fungi and you really shouldn't have fungi in your tissues. So it's a sugar associated with fungi and they're trying to get rid of that. And by getting rid of that sugar, it gets rid of the fungi. Uh, the sugar is just more of a signal that, hey, we've got a fungus among us. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, it's kind of like, uh, let's see if I can use a, uh, a, a an analogy that's, that's, uh, not problematic. It's hard to use an analogy that's not problematic. Oh, let's do politics. Say I'm at a, I, I am intending to go to the convention of one party, so I dress in a certain color and I show up at the wrong convention. <laughs> that, uh, you know, I'm going to get a lot of responses <laughs> because I'm wearing the wrong color. So mannose is, uh, you know, the fungus wearing the wrong color. And it says, hey, you're not supposed to be here. Die, die, die. Hopefully, if I showed up at the wrong convention, that would not happen. But, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> so, so it's kind of like that. So it's not necessarily the sugar itself. It's more um, of it's a signal that there's, there's a, a bigger problem. And in yeah, fact, we, sense. yeah, yeah. So actually, we use um, mannose as a, um, no, actually, it's mannitol. Never mind. Um, I was going to say we use mannose as a, uh, a low calorie sweetener, but actually, we don't. Because, you know, that would probably stimulate long term inflammation. So, but mannitol is a different thing. That's a different sugar. Okay. So these are three different ways to start the complement cascade. Okay. So we get three different results that we're going to worry about in this class. Okay? Uh, the first one that's going to happen is we are going to get increased phagocytosis. Okay? So we call this optimization. And it comes from the Latin to make tasty. So that means increased phagocytosis. So it's like I've uh, sprinkled some salt or some, uh, some good uh, um, pepper sauce on the food and the phagocytes say, oh yeah, now let's, uh, we're going to eat some more. This is just tastes too good. But what's actually happening, I'm going to have to draw it up here. Tell me what, tell you what, I'm going to get rid of this. I have room to do some drawings. 
without getting rid of everything. Okay, so I have a, let's say I've got a monocyte. Okay. Okay. So it has receptors. Think of it as kind of like teeth. And so if there is, using the classical example, okay, I've got a bacterium and I am covered in antibodies that have complements on them. The complement matches up with these teeth. So it allows the phagocyte to grab a hold better. It's like I'm giving the pathogen a handle where normally they'd be kind of slippery, okay? So that's, uh, that's the mechanism between optimization, okay? So it allows macrophages to swallow the bacteria down easy. And so because they do a better job of it, we think of them as going, mm, yum, I'm so happy you sprinkled compliments all over this because, you know, I love me some compliments. Okay. Now, the alternative pathway and the lectin pathway would do the same thing because we still have this complement here and the phagocytes can still grab a hold of the phagocytes easier. Okay. So three different ways of starting and arriving at the same result. Okay. Okay. Now another result. Okay. We get formation of pores. Okay. And we call these pores membrane attack complexes or MACs. Okay. So these MACs form pores, and these pores allow the cell to be lysed, okay, or popped. So here's what's happening here. Let's go ahead and, and use my example from the alternative pathway. Although the classical alternative and lectin binding pathways can all result in max, okay. But I've got this bacterium, okay, and I have complement that has bound to the surface. It's bound to a membrane or a microbial associated molecular pattern, okay? So it calls in its buddies, okay? The other complements that are floating around and they do some splitting and they do some fancy dancy stuff. And basically they form pores, okay? So the poor bacterium, although it's a pathogen, I can't feel too bad about it, gets all these pores. This allows, um, water to flow in and because there's not an, a, a strong wall or membrane to keep it from popping, okay, it does cause it to pop, okay. And this can happen with uh, protozoa, with bacteria, with fungi, okay. Even though they've got cell walls, cell walls can help for a bit, but if you've got a bunch of holes in your membrane, you're gonna pop inside that wall, okay? So complement can get together to form these MACs, which are pores, which cause the cell to lyse, okay? Okay, now the third thing that we're going to be worried about for this class is complement stimulates inflammation. Uh, you know what, I think I started out wrong. Let's go ahead and try that again. There we go. Okay, yes, ma'am. Okay, so those are three pathways that will activate, right? Yeah. Like three beginnings and they all come to the same conclusion. Yeah. Now, do they all happen at the same time or are they different outcomes depending on the pathogen? Um, 
you know, it, it, you're right. It does depend upon the pathogen. Um, these MACs can start forming immediately, but obviously bacteria and um, fungi are going to be more resistant to MACs. Okay. Um, they're all going to get swallowed down, you know, protozoa and, uh, you know, uh, bacteria will get swallowed down. Yeast are kind of a hard cell. They're kind of big. But when we get inflammation and you get a whole bunch of immune cells coming in, like eosinophils can come in and start dumping their bombs on the yeast um, or on the worm, okay? Um, inflammation brings in the other guys. So they all happen and they keep trying until they, they kill whatever they're out to kill. Okay, so all three of those happen at the same time, no matter yeah. the start. Yeah. Well, you know, Max tend to, to, for, to start first because, you know, the complement forms these Max right away. And inflammation happens pretty quickly because these signals go out. And then if there happens to be macrophages already there, um, they start phagocytizing, but also more come in and keep doing more and more. So I would say, you know, it starts out here, it goes to here, and then it goes to here. But they're all pretty much happening at the same time. Hey, how are we doing? Okay, real quick, let's talk about inflammation. Okay, then th that's why I did this one last is so that I can do a new screen and we can talk about inflammation. Okay, so I'm gonna have you read about uh, the uh, four and we've added a fifth cardinal sign of inflammation, you know, in other words, how do we tell if somebody's got inflammation, okay? That's pretty straightforward. But let's talk about the three phases of inflammation, okay? So we have the first phase, which is vascular changes. Okay? And then we get, and I have promptly forgotten, Oh, let me look it up. I know it involves, uh, oh, that's what I thought it was. I was going to say cellular recruitment, but it's lymphocyte recruitment. Or leukocyte, not lymphocyte. So, ah, ah, sorry about that. Let me go back to the whiteboard. I was going for the eraser and I went to, to stop share. Stop. Okay, and then thirdly, we have resolution. Okay, because anytime we start something in the body, we want to be able to turn it off. Because if it keeps going, that's a problem. Okay. So <clears throat> I have damage. Okay. Or complement has bound to. Um, you know, a pathogen, but let's use the specific example of I'm cooking dinner and I cut myself and I happen to be cooking chicken. Therefore, I get some salmonella. There wasn't much salmonella on my, on my chicken, but there was some, you know, cutting up raw chicken and then I cut myself. And so I have now introduced um, uh, salmonella into my system. I have also uh, popped some of my eukaryotic cells, okay? I now have a big old hole in my tissue, my skin tissue cells, okay? So because I've popped, you know, little capillaries, the first thing that's gonna happen is I'm gonna start bleeding, okay? Um, but at immediately the same time, signals go out. Cytokines go out saying, ah, I've been stabbed. 
And then complement are going to bind, okay, almost immediately because salmonella have all sorts of uh, molecular associated, or excuse me, microbial associated molecular patterns, NAMPs, okay. And so they're going to set up signals that are going to say, help. Okay. So the first thing that happens is cytokines are released. Okay. Um, and part of those uh, complement in this situation would be considered okay, a cytokine because they're talking to the cells. Okay. And so these signals, okay, so my little capillary down here, the one that didn't get stabbed by the knife when I cut myself, okay, um, are going to become leaky. And I'm going to have fluid coming out. Okay. Now, because this is coming out in response to um, inflammation, we call it exudate, okay, exit, exudate, okay, um, but it's really the same stuff as plasma and um, interstitial fluid and uh, lymph, okay, it's just where it happens to be and why, okay, so we have this fluid coming, okay, so that also allows the cytokines, okay, to come in, okay, and start circulating. So I have a whole lot of neutrophils tumbling along, okay. I also have macrophages, okay, or excuse me, they're monocytes at this point. As they get the signals, they say, oh, I need to stop and get out. And they wiggle through the pores that have opened up, okay, in a process called diapedesis, okay. Ped means for foot, okay. So they get out here and they start fighting, okay. So actually, uh, the, the vascular changes, I shouldn't have sh shown uh, diapedesis quite yet. That's part of leukocyte re um, recruitment, okay? So cytokines are released. My vessels get leaky. Okay, which allows, okay, neutrophils. Okay, monocytes. Okay, and later on I might get, you know, eosinophils and uh, basophils. Okay, mast cells are already going to be here. So they may have released some cytokines. Okay. All right. So these guys start wiggling through the leaky vessels. Okay. And they get there and they start releasing more cytokines. Okay, because just because you're the first responder to get there, you're going to need help. Okay, because I've only drawn a few salmonella, there could be a whole bunch. And especially, we don't want them replicating, okay, causing long term damage. Now, a lot of pathogens are able to either stop or destroy cytokine release, okay? But others can't, and with most environmental microbes, your immune system is gonna clear it out before it causes disease, okay? Pathogens are unique in that they can get around these things and still cause disease, okay? So cytokines are released, both of these phagocytides, Okay, so I've got complement covering these, so they have something to grab a hold of. Max are being formed, they're popping, releasing more signals, okay? <clears throat> so we're going to get more and more and more, okay, until your body no longer senses that there's a pathogen or damaged cells, okay? So once, okay, once there is 
Um, we're not recognizing any uh, microbial associated molecular patterns. Okay. Um, Complement, as soon as it forms, we have other molecules that come through and break it down. Okay. So when complement okay, stops doing its cascade, okay, and your leukocytes stop releasing cytokines. Okay, because they, you know, they're going, hey, you know what? I'm not finding anything to eat here, guys. You guys finding anything to eat? Maybe we should stop releasing cytokines. Okay. So I'm going to put reduction. Okay. All of this leads to your neutrophils and your monocytes leaving. Okay. So the cells leave. Okay, unless they're there to help clean up. Okay. And we've had clotting occur. We have cells that come and eat the, the dead and damaged cells. They clear out the dead and damaged bacteria. Okay, so we still have um, mainly your macrophages hanging around. Okay, but we don't have as many of them. Mainly the cells that leave are your neutrophils. Okay, because they're going off to look for something else. Okay, sometimes your macrophages stay in the area. If there was a problem once, there might be a problem again. Okay, sometimes they head over to your lymph nodes to say, hey, we had a problem here. Anybody, do have, are you already making antibodies against this? Okay, but we call this resolution when we start seeing a reduction in inflammation because the danger is over, okay? All right, how are we doing? Okay, we've got two minutes left. That is enough time for, let's say, let's do one question and then we'll go real quick. I won't, uh, you'll have to, you'll have to vote quickly because I'm going to give you 30 seconds. Okay, so you develop a small break in the lining of your intestine, the lining of colon and your tissues, complement proteins bind directly to the proteins in the outer membrane, which complement activation pathway is this? Good job, we just passed 50%. Timer isn't working. Why is my timer on the phone not working? Okay, we're at 90%. We're going to call that good. Okay, so most of you picked alternative. You are correct. Okay, because the complement is binding directly to proteins in the outer membrane. Okay, that are recognized as foreign. Now, if you picked classical, okay. That would be correct if I said, because of course you've been again exposed to E. coli, you probably have antibodies floating around, okay? But I didn't mention antibodies, okay? If I'd mentioned antibodies, you would have been correct, okay? And if I'd mentioned binding to mannose using lectin, then that would have been correct, okay? So I did that rapid fire. Don't feel bad if you pick the right, uh, the incorrect one, okay? All right, so like I said, I'm going to have these questions in the practice quiz, but uh, let me stop the show. No, I do not want to keep the annotations. Let's go to the end. Well, let's go to things to keep in mind. Now, the embedded tutoring assignment is due a week from Friday, okay? So there's no rush, but if you feel like doing it, okay? Also, you know, we've got exam four. I don't have it on here for some strange reason. But exam four does open up this Friday. Um, that seems really quick. I don't know about you, but it seems really quick to me. I haven't finished writing it yet. Um, but you have a week and a day from this Friday in which to take exam four. Okay, so, you know, wrap up your study. It's going to cover chapters nine, 10, and 11, this chapter. Okay, so nine and 10 shouldn't be too bad. 11 might be a bit of a hard sell. Okay. Uh, but flashcards, flashcards work for me.
All right. And then next week, we're going to start adapting the Yeah. All right. Any questions? Yeah, I had one about that last question you popped up. Oh, sure. Let's go back to it. Uh, here we go. Um, since all of the pathways <clears throat> create max formation, why is it specifically alternative if all of the pathways create it? Uh, because there's three different ways of getting to max. So when your complement proteins bind directly to anything on the pathogen, it's alternative. If you have something in between, like if an antibody bound first and then the complement bounds to the antibody, that's classical. If you have your um, uh, lectin mannose binding proteins bind first and then the complement binds to that, that's the lectin pathway. Does that help? Yes, it does. Yeah. And I'll have, um, different variations on this question so that um, you can practice picking out which one is which. And I'll also have some that are the opposite. Okay, so you had a cascade start from the classical pathway and it results in pores forming. What do we call those pores? And you would pick MAC. Or if the phagocytes do their job better because they have something to grab onto, then you would pick optimization. Okay, any other questions? 